will alert me if there is um, a question. And um, if you have a question that you want to ask in front of the whole class, just use the little raise hand option under your reactions button. And uh, that'll pop you to the top so that we can see that your hand is raised. And we'll try to get that addressed. I have a lovely assistant who's going to be helping me in the second half of the class, and you'll meet her in a little bit. Um, but first, we're going to talk about section leaders and what is a section leader, and what are your roles, and what is your what are your duties? And um, the goal for this class is to give you some tools to effectively carry out your section leader duties. Um, there are tons and tons and tons of books and writings and internet articles about what makes a good section leader. Um, I was specifically tasked with how to listen as a section leader and what to do with the information once you have listened and heard. Because listening and hearing are different activities, don't we all know? Um, so you're now, as a section leader, in a position where you are going to be required to diagnose problems and to prescribe instruction for your singers to correct those problems or to enhance the skills they have or to learn new skills. That's a big goal. And um, sorry, I need to not get distracted by the chat. <laughs> Wee, I'm a visual learner, can you tell? Um, so you're, you need to now employ a bunch of different new skills that you may not ever have thought about in connection with singing. And first and foremost of those are listening skills. And you may think, oh, that's pretty easy. That's why I'm a section leader. I know my part, and I can hear pretty well. And I have some pretty decent people skills and what could go wrong, right? And uh, so first of all, I need to tell you that you're going to listen with more than your ears, okay? Now you need to use many more senses to assess and to find the root of an issue that you need to address. So the first thing you're going to do is listen with your eyes. And that sounds funny, but you need to get a physical overview of what this instrument is that's been presented to you um, because that is what you're going to be working with and it's okay to hear it but sometimes the clues to what the issue is are going to be visual or they're going to be physical and so you need to be able to learn how to assess the physicality of your instrument in front of you and figure out what to do with it from there are they projecting any physical hints of discomfort um, look how they stand. How do they breathe? Do they show a sign of an illness? Are they embarrassed to be put on the spot? Um, are they tired? Are they not interested in being here at all? I'm just going to sit in the back and be silent and invisible. And uh, so you need to kind of assess what's going on with the instrument in front of you. Secondly, you're going to start listening with your ears. You need to see what their sound is telling you. Are they breath deprived? Are they nervous? Do they have tuning issues? Are they tentative? Maybe because they're not sure they know the music well enough to be doing it by themselves. That's why they joined a chorus. They didn't join a quartet. They joined a chorus to sing with other people because they were nervous about singing on their own. Um, definitely want to kind of get a vibe for what is the quality of the sound that they're producing. Okay. Then you need to listen with your heart because there may be a non-musical issue that's affecting them that day. And they may, be, they may not be comfortable telling you about it. They may hide it, but it may manifest itself in either their physicality or in their voice. <clears throat> Don't continue to spotlight them if this becomes the issue. Move on to someone else and don't continue to put them on the hot seat and make them be in uncomfortable in front of other people. Okay? So listen with your eyes first, with your ears second, and with your heart as well. So that's a big holistic approach. And like I said, if you have any questions, stick them up in, or comments, put them up in the chat, and we'll bring them in. Because you'll be touching an emotional place in your singers, you need to learn to provide critique without judgment. And that may sound contradictory, but your job is not to judge. Your job is to evaluate and to provide feedback and to provide skills to improve. It's not your, it's not your place to make a critique about how they're doing it or what, what you need to, um, what you think they need to do to fix. It's your idea, it's your job to, to evaluate what they're doing and see if you can give them some tools to make it better. 
Um, a thing came up in chat that says, many people have to sit and sing. How do we help them? Well, we help them by making sure that their instrument is as tall as it can be and it's still allowing them to sit. You can sit up on the edge of your chair or sit up tall in your chair. Like Drew was talking, I wrote this down, it's awesome, tall and noble. You can be tall and noble in a chair and still be, you know, sitting there because you may not either have the physical ability to stand or you may not have the breath energy to stand and sing. Okay. One of the things we have to be aware of coming back live and singing is that with COVID and with being at home in our living rooms for a year and a half, we don't have the breath stamina that we had when we were standing on the risers for three hours every week. So breath, breath management is going to be one of those things that you're going to have to be able to diagnose and work on. And I loved all the breathing exercises that Drew gave us. All right. Critique without judgment. So there's two sides to every communication interaction the giving and the receiving. And we all know that that's where the problem comes up, right? Because the giver may mean one thing and the receiver may, mean, may perceive it as something else. Perception is everything in communication. So you want to make sure that the tone and content of your words make the message land successfully and not shoot a hurtful arrow into the heart of your listener, okay? So you need to not only listen to what the sound is, you need to listen to what the message is and listen with your, with your eyes and your heart to see if your message is successfully landing. You need to also listen to yourself as you're given that message, okay? Because what the, what the receiver hears may not be what you intended. And our first, always our first law of section leader land is do no harm, okay? These people have put their egos and their psyches and their voice in your hand, and it's a precious commodity, and you need to make sure that you do nothing to harm that singer. All right. Any questions about that? I'm going to have just a drink of water because it's very dry in here today. So in your toolkit of skills, your diagnostic skills, not only are you listening with a variety of different techniques, you need to also be able to teach to a variety of different techniques because now you're being presented with a room full of people who have different learning styles, who have different processing styles, who have different uh, listening st skills, and um, who have different ways that they, they use information or that they make their process happen to have sound come out of their mouth. Okay, so you have visual learners, those who need to see it. That, that is me. I need to see it on the page. My brain can process it. It has it. And then it's like a little ticker tape parade coming across my, eye, my, my forehead when I'm seeing the music go by. Um, so you need to be able to demonstrate and show the visual learner, either on the music or on your body, the concept that you're trying to convey. If you're trying to show tuning things, you may have to show the music and show what the tuning relationship is. If you're trying to uh, convey a vocal production technique, you may need to show it on your body to convey it. And uh, I'm going to be doing a little bit of that a little bit later on with Janice. <clears throat> you also have auditory learners, those who hear, who learn best by hearing the information. So your words and your sound will be best understood by this learner. You will either uh, sing a demonstration of what you're going for, or your words themselves as you tell as you speak them will tell this learner what they need to know. Then you have the kinesthetic learners. Um, can you say and demonstrate, and even better, have them join you in performing the technique that you want to convey with their own instrument? Can you provide movements or hand motions that can reinforce the techniques you're describing? Sometimes just um, you know a simple turn the page will give somebody a signal of how to smooth out a phrase, okay? So there's a bunch of different, I tried to find my handout of the different movements for kinesthetic learners this morning, and I couldn't put my hands on it, which means it's probably on a different computer. Um, but there are some, and if I come up with them, I will, I will add those to my handouts on the, on the website. Not only that, you're also dealing with left brain versus right brain learners. So you may need to provide different types of examples to appeal to the technical learners. Um, you know, talking about the tuning system and 
the intervals by name and you know the, the scale notes and whatnot versus the artistic listeners where you may get to them by talking about the emotion you're trying to convey or you know what kind of sound what flavor of sound do you want to hear by talking about colors or flavors or food or something like that um, so there is that so any questions about learning styles or the concept of needing to be open to more than just a person singing in front of you and saying that's wrong. Thank you, Ariel. Ariel says there's there's some kinesthetics on the last page of my handout. Were there really? Oh, I guess there are. Okay. So, <clears throat> Beth, I have a question. Yes. Uh, this is Karen Kelly. In, Hi, in, a, in a rehearsal, hi. In a section rehearsal, we generally don't have the time to work with each single person. Uh, can you give some ideas how to kind of do a holistic approach with all these different types of, of learning? Or are you actually speaking to like if we're doing like a one-on-one? -on -one? Great Thank question. You. Great question. So there are classes all among themselves on how to give a PDI. And um, that would be also a really good skill for you to have under your belt, just in case your director wants you to help uh, with giving personal instruction. Yes, it's, it's a luxury to have a long enough section rehearsal or to have a small enough section that you can give individual feedback to your singers. Um, but there's nothing that says you can't call an additional section rehearsal outside and have a whole evening or half a Saturday with them. Okay, so. If it's something that might be for the benefit of your section, you might want to consider having an extended um, rehearsal with them uh, because it's always like one of the things you guys said in, in Drew's class was building the unit sound. First and foremost, you have to build a section unity to contribute to that unit sound, right? Um, holistically, <clears throat> and in a you know 20 or 30 minute sectional during a chorus rehearsal, um, number one, my first, number one goal and rule when I run a sectional is we're not going to learn notes and words in the sectional. I expect you to come with your notes and words learned. That is not the place where we're going to teach notes and words. Section rehearsal is for um, going over problem areas. If the section is having a hard time getting the proper notes uh, on a passage, then we need to break it down and figure out what's going on in that passage and what tips can I give them for making those passages successful, but I'm not gonna waste cor chorus, valuable chorus sectional time on learning notes and words. My job is to um, make my, my section sound like one voice, to make sure that we contribute to the sound of the chorus, and to make sure my singers understand the barbershop craft and how to use it in their voice part. So holistically, when I get to a short rehearsal and there's something that needs to be addressed, um, I'm gonna start First off, by doing as they're singing and I'm not, I'm going to be starting off by doing my visual assessment as I'm watching them sing the song. And then um, as a general rule, uh, I, I'm a tenor and so my section is never, except when we were 130 people, I'm, I'm not ever in a room full of 20 people in my section rehearsal. You know, right now there's four of us. And uh, so it's really easy for me to come up with a plan while they're singing to be able to work with them going, going through the rest of the rehearsal. And again, because I don't maybe want to embarrass or call out someone who's not comfortable with it, I'm not going to necessarily say, oh, Mary Sue, you were flat for that whole passage. Because why? I just told her, A, she did something wrong, B, called her out, embarrassed her in front of the whole group, and then is she going to be open to trying to learn and do anything well for the rest of rehearsal? No, she's not, because I sent a hurtful arrow to her. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, so we weren't all making the same kind of sound through that run-through. Um, let's, let's see if we can try this. And then I will give them a variety of different techniques, and we're going to cover some of those techniques when I get to the, to the demonstration section um, as well. And some of them are what Drew did in his warm-up as well. Um, always, 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 most of the base root of what's happening is the singer is getting in their own way. 
And so you want to find ways to get the singer out of their own way. And it's hard to do, and if there's no one-size-fits-all solution to singing problems. Um, so when you give generic advice to the whole group or holistic advice to the whole group, there are some, go there are some people who you have to say, this doesn't apply to you because you don't have this issue. Okay, so it, it's really important that you know your singer's voices. Be very familiar with your singer's voices because you're going to have overachievers in your section and they're going to say, oh, she said, I had to do, she said we had to do that, so I must do it, and I must do it 110%. Well, sometimes that person doesn't have that issue, and them doing that 110% might make another issue crop up. Okay, so you need to be really cognizant of when you're making blanket statements to the section. If there are people who don't need to participate in that, you have to say, except for you, because that is not your issue. Um, then that's a good thing to know. Okay. Very different goals for section rehearsals versus as breakouts during a chorus rehearsal versus one that is held outside of the chorus on a separate day. Absolutely, Cassidy. You can get into so much more and so much more individual work when you when you have a section on another day. <clears throat> okay. So being a section leader is harder than being a non-section leader, isn't it? Not only do you have to worry about your music, you have to worry about the music of your section. But it doesn't mean you get to be a dictator. You have to help your section. You're not there to, you're there to serve the people in your section, not to rule over them. No matter how fabulous or wonderful you are, it is not your job to rule. Uh, you need to lead by example. Uh, if you are not the best example of what you want to try to convey, is there someone in your section who can be your demo person? Um, I've been in choruses where the person who has the skills to run a sectional is not necessarily the person who's the best demonstrator for, for whatever reason. And so they, they designated a person in the section who was the voice they wanted the section to emulate because, you know, monkey see, monkey do. If they hear something, they're going to try to imitate it. So whatever is put in front of them, you want it to be the best quality. And if that is not you, you need to put your ego in the back seat and say, okay, I can't do this, but Kathy, can you, can you demonstrate this for me? Because I think your tone quality is what I want the section to emulate. Okay. Hold sectionals. Don't wait for the director to call one. If you want to get your section together early before chorus or on another day, do it. You know, all the, all the time, the extra time together as a section builds so much more unity and it will, it will move your course forward leaps and bounds. Help your section when they need it. Let them practice. But if you see someone struggling with a part or singing it wrong without realizing it, step in and help them. Because why? Practice makes permanent. Okay? Practice doesn't make perfection, and we're not looking for perfection, but practice makes permanent. And you want to make sure it's correct what they're practicing. Be understanding. People have lives outside of chorus. <laughs> I know, hard to believe, isn't it? Hold your section to their promises. If someone said they'll learn a passage by next Tuesday, they better have it down when next Tuesday comes along. If they don't, ask them why they didn't. You have to have accountability, not just on you, but on your singers, because it's a two-way contract. Be you. Your director chose you to be the section leader. You're still a member of your section, and your extra authority doesn't mean you can't take part in the rest of the activities. In fact, spending more time with your section makes you a better leader. And it also helps you to know their voices better. Keep your section under control. Rehearsal time is limited and essential to the success of the sectional. Keep them focused and on the task at hand. And don't overload them with the amount of things they're trying to accomplish during the rehearsal. Right? Two or three things. Maybe you only have 20 minutes. Pick the song that needs the most work. Pick the topic that needs the most attention to your section. Listen to both sides of a conflict. If there's a conflict, so-and-so said to do it this way. Yeah, but I thought we were supposed to do it this way. Then you need to be able to be firm but decisive in what the answer is. Sometimes you have to be less diplomatic when saying, this is the way the section is going to approach this. 
and it's just factual, it's just a factual statement of fact. Be on the same page as your director. Don't stand in a sectional and say something that's contradictory to what the director wants for the song, okay? She has the final say, and you are her servant. So in the hierarchy of needs, you are below the director, you are not equal to her, and you are not above her, or him. Sorry, Drew. Remember the team. No matter what goals you have for your section, don't lose sight for what's best for the entire chorus. Each section must work together to achieve what is best for the entire ensemble, and your director's goals may take priority over what you want for your section. Okay, this may, this may mean that if you have a long-term goal for vocal production improvement in your section, there may be something going on in a song and a chorus where that might be counter to what you're trying to work on long-term. Just know that your goal is a long-term goal and the immediate goal serves the music as it is now with what the director wants to do, okay? Do your best to offer advice in a way that doesn't hurt anyone's feelings. Two sides to the communication, as we said, giving and receiving. Words matter and words can hurt, right? Any questions on those qualities of a section leader? You probably heard some of this already last night, but I wanted to make sure and talk about it because all of your shared experience and all of the experiences in your life and all of your singing experience go into what you now have as a listening device, okay? You are the listening device in all of your senses. And so you need to bring all of your skills to bear. It's not a job that you can do on automatic pilot. You have to be absolutely actively engaged in interaction with the people in your section, okay? Talk about benefits of extremes to find the middle ground. Well, did I come up with examples for that? No, but can I? Um, so we have a coach come in and work with the chorus. And the, for whatever reason, the coach doesn't click with the chorus. You know how this happens. But we paid money for the coach to come in, and the coach said to do this technique that we want to make sure we cram our sound up in the front of our face, okay? And your director does not agree with that, and it does not produce the kind of sound that she wants her chorus to be singing. And so you go through the day of coaching with the co coach, and the next rehearsal comes around, and the director says, okay, so that was a very interesting experience that we had with Jane Doe, uh, what did we take away from that? And so the chorus may be feeling uncomfortable because they know it's contrary to what the, the director's been working on. And so they're uncomfortable already. Um, so the director may say, we're going to take that information that Jane Doe gave us and uh, thank her for what she contributed, but I do not want you to proceed with this technique that she taught. Okay. So there may be somebody who misses that talk at chorus and comes to sectional and tries to do that technique that Jane Doe taught and her voice is sticking out of the section because the section went back to singing unified like the director wants, okay? So, th so you have to be able to lovingly explain to the outlier that we have decided not to do that technique, but I practiced it for the last two weeks and I've got it down pat. That's really great. And now you have a tool, an extra tool, but for right now we need a different type of sound. And so I need you to, to think about what the sound was before Jane Doe came and go back and try to bring your voice back in alignment. Use your listening skills, listen to the rest of the section and try to sing like the rest of the section. Okay, so you need to acknowledge that she heard something different Acknowledge that she took it and ran with it. Acknowledge that she worked on it outside of chorus. Yay. Uh, but now say, you need to lovingly let go of that because it's wrong. And I want you to do something different. But you need to do it in such a way that doesn't say, you're wrong, and I want you to do it my way or the highway. Does that make sense? That's just one I made up off the top of my head. Hope that answers your question, Bigo. Okay, so remember, a good leader is selfless. Take the blame give the credit away. It's not about you. It's about the section. If you get back in chorus and the director stops and says, oh my gosh, baritones, that was the best ever. Whatever you did in the section rehearsal was awesome. Because that's exactly the sound that I want. That's your cherry on top of the sundae. Don't be bossy. There's a fine line between asserting yourself and just being a jerk. Remember the first rule is do no harm. 
Make sure you don't get too power hungry. Remember that being a section leader doesn't mean you have control over every minute aspect of your section's lives. Don't let other people in your section tell you or your section what to do, especially in a rehearsal. Ask people to give you feedback or information privately. You can discuss it with them and you can then get back to them and then get to, back to the whole section if you want to take their advice and move forward. All right, so that's a lot of stuff. And no, I didn't do any um, PowerPoints or handouts on that, but I can. I can give you my script um, if you want it. Uh, but it's a lot of words, and I wanted you to absorb it um, rather than being distracted by looking at it. Okay, because I may be a visual learner, but you may not be. So if you, you visual learners want the script, let me know, and I'll put it up there. So now I'd like to bring in my lovely assistant, Janice McKenna. I think most of you know her. She agreed to be my guinea pig this morning. And um, I have some scenarios that I'm going to be running through uh, with Janice, and she's going to do the demonstration. And we're going to uh, do some little role playing <laughs> for how you would, uh, if you were in a one-on-one -on -one session with one of your sectional section people, um, how you would address it. Now I'm hoping you can see this well enough. My my cord and my living room are not quite tall enough, and so we're going to get back towards the wall. And because we have microphones in our ears, you can hear us. All right. Can you hear me in your ears? Raise your hand, Nancy Kurz. Okay, cool. All right, so. Um, one of the things uh, that I loved about what Drew did in his um, warm-up class were some of the techniques he had are what I would call distraction techniques to get people out of their way when you're assessing and working with their voices. Um, so let me just tell you those right now, and then we'll work on them as we go through with Janice. So when you hear something going on in someone's sound, sometimes to get them out of their way, you need to distract them by taking attention away from whatever it is they're doing to be in their way and bring up to let the body do what it needs to do to make sound, okay? So my favorite distracting techniques are humming the passage, if you're having trouble with a passage, singing it, either because of where it fits in your range or in your tessitura, or if you're just not warmed up enough and so you're tight, or if you're having trouble with the words interfering with what the notes are doing, uh, if it's a jumpy part line, humming takes all that distraction out and it gets right down to pure sound focused exactly where it needs to happen for your instrument. So humming the line is good. Bubbling also, if you can bubble, is another one. Um, doing it on the NG I love because it does kind of focus some brilliance and some ping. If, if you need that in the sound, choose the NG. If you need the resonance and the warmth in the sound, choose the humming, okay? Um, doing some gentle movement, like I said, turn the page, wash the window, um, serve the platter, whatever. Um, there are movements that you can do to try to get the body freed up. Uh, it's also hand talking. You know, if how Italians are and they talk with their hands a lot, I tend to talk with my hands a lot when I'm not holding papers or doing it on Zoom. So, you know, have them sing with a lot of hand gestures, which we are not going to have when we're performing, but those hand gestures will distract sometimes the tension from happening around the vocal mechanism. And have your toes grab the carpet. If you're having trouble, like if you have somebody who's really breathing shallow from the chest, or they're not really grounding their breath deep in the belly, or they're not grounding their sound in their whole body, have them grab the, t the carpet with their toes. Just kind of clench the carpet with their toes. That transfers tension down to larger muscles lower in the body. Takes more of the m muscle away from it. Still has some muscle involvement, but takes it away from it being so tight up here. So grab the carpet with your toes. Those are my favorite distraction techniques. Pardon me just a moment. Any questions? about that. All right. So we're going to go forward and, and talk about some different scenarios of things you might encounter and strategies for dealing with them. First, we're going to talk about body alignment. I'll do this one because I got this one down. So 
one of the first and foremost things that we hear a lot is watch your posture. And when you say posture, what, is it, what does it say? It says, I'm going to get myself erect and hold myself in place, right? And I know you can't really see all of me very well, but if I'm going to hold my posture, then I'm going to do posture, right? Does it look like I'm comfortable for singing? And then the director says, come forward on the pitch. And so you do this. Does that look like you're stable and ready to sing? No, it does not. What we want to do is we want to talk about body alignment. So body alignment is a dynamic concept, and it's always changing, and it's always fluid, and it's not ever held in place, and you don't ever use a muscle intentionally to hold it. There are muscles that fire to keep you holding it erect in space, and those muscles do their job without you engaging them on a, on a voluntary basis. Um, and so you need to let them do their work and get out of the way, okay? So if I'm going to do posture, which already I put my legs close together to do posture because you can't see them, but we had pretty feet when I sang in Lakeside Chorus 30 years ago. And that was our posture, you know? Um, and so do I feel like I can move and support my instrument? You no, know, if I was going to move anywhere, you know, I'm not stable. I want to have my feet comfortably apart facing forward, my feet facing the same place that my face is pointing, um, about the width of my shoulder. And I want my knees to be soft because if I lock my knees for very long, I might pass out. And I want my arms to be relaxed and loose. And I want this area where the instrument is housed to be relaxed, not bunched up tight under my ears and not held down with a muscle. I just want it to be loose and dynamic. So that if I needed to provide extra support under the sound, I can. Or if I need to restate, or if I need to make a movement, I can do that from a position of strength. So that's alignment versus posture. Now, what's, what do we see sometimes? We see on the risers. We see this. So get good posture. So you go from this to this, and then you still have... Oh, aren't I so good? I wore a cold shoulder top so you can see where my shoulders are. See where my shoulders are in position to my ears and how they're not. Okay, so they say, you know, stand tall. Okay, so I'm going to stand tall, but my shoulders are still forward, right? Look at my arm. Bring your, bring your arms to your side seams. Okay, do I look comfortable? No. Do I look large? Yes. What I want is to be relaxed, see now where my shoulders are. They're just even with my ears, I hope, but they're relaxed, my shoulders are relaxed. Okay, any questions about alignment? Okay, awesome. All right, Janice, come join us. What else do we see in posture? Sometimes we see a raised chin. So, you know, Janice is a bass, God love her. And we're going to sing a song that may be high, and she's just convinced that if she raises her chin, it's going to help her hit that high note. Mm, my country. I know. <laughs> because we're demonstrating. We both were laughing this morning because doing it wrong is sometimes harder than remembering what you're doing to do it right. right? So I'm asking her to do a bunch of stuff wrong that she's unlearned. My, here we go. My country tis of thee. Can I stop now? No. <laughs> Sweet land of liberty. I want to hear you go for the high one. Of thee I sing. Land <laughs> now you can stop. <laughs> she needs a latte for that now. All right, so did you see her? She raised her chin to try to go for land. And what did that do? It brought a harshness and a and a muscle tension to her sound. All right, so now, Janice, I want you to put your nose, your finger on your nose, and I want you to peer over the top of your reading glasses, and now hum that. I can't hum. Mm -hmm. 
good, 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 good. Yeah, yeah. And so it wasn't hugely loud up on the top, but it was relaxed. And as a bass, she doesn't need to be hugely loud up there. And especially if we're singing in unison, there's plenty of people whose range that is in that will carry the weight of the, of the balance requirements for that. All right, good. Tension in the tongue and throat. So I want you to, um, can you hold tension in your tongue and make your throat tense and sing my country again, but do my country. My country, tis a sweet land of liberty. Good, that's enough. So can you hear the tension in your sound? I know it's hard to hear over Zoom, um, and it probably, you know, compresses it a little bit, but I can definitely hear. Now, I want you to do, I want you to hum, hum the My Country Tis of thee and come into words on Sweet Land of Liberty, okay? Mm-hmm. Words. Sweet Land of Liberty. Definitely a difference, okay? I can hear a definite difference in the room. Um, I hope you could hear it there too. Also, it brought forward much more dimension from her resonators, um, whereas before she had forced the resonation to happen in more in the back of the mouth um, when she was using muscle. Awesome. Seven minutes. Um, full voice present versus thin sound. Let me do this one. Okay. So a thin sound is um, a lot of times we find a thin sound with someone who is trying to do everything that every coach and director has ever told them about vocal production, okay? Sometimes we need to edit the information for our singers, especially the overachievers, because they want to do everything they're told. And they're, all they're doing is piling things on top of each other. Right now I have a room in the back, my sewing room looks like that, where my husband's t- shoved everything in there and shut the door. So that's like putting all your techniques in one place and shutting the door because they don't know which technique to use and they've convinced themselves they're doing it right, okay? One of my big pet peeves as a coach is not hearing everyone's full and present voice until the last note of the song when the director says, let's grow. And then there's their perfect sound that I could have been hearing for the whole time of the song, okay? So... I'm a tenor, and am I warm up enough to do this? Let's see. I'm going to sing a thin sound, what I call a thin sound, um, which means I'm going to just make my sound less than it is. My country, tis of the sweet land of liberty. That's such a not good pitch for me. My country, let's do that. My country, tis of the Sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. It actually takes more breath for me to sing that way than it does for me to sing with my full voice. So if I want to sing my full voice, I want to make sure that I'm making much more use of the space in the room, much more use of my air under my sound, much more use of my natural resonation. Mm-hmm. My country, no, my country tis of thee, my country tis of thee. I just pulled all the air and the space and the resonation out. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. Do you hear much more in my voice than when I was singing then? Yes? Awesome. Always good when the demonstration works. So how do you get the person to project that sound? Okay. What what are you telling them to do? So what I tell them, what I'm trying to do is get the distract, use a distraction technique and get them out of their way. And I do tell them, you are getting in the way of your full voice sound. And you are saving your full voice sound. And it may sound really great to you because when you think you're singing with your full voice sound, It's happening all inside of you, so it sounds really great to you, but it's not happening out here because you're not letting it outside. So the harmony party is happening in your mouth, and we need the party to be happening out here. So what I might ask them to do is to sing into a big soup pot in the center of the section, okay? So that tends to work. Mostly you want to just get the sound out of of them and out into into the air, 
so that all the voices can blend together for a unified ensemble. Okay? So first I might use some visual images to try to distract them. And if the singing into the stew pot or to hold the stew pot and to fill the space or to ask them to imagine that there's a garage door in the back of their neck and that they're going to send their sound out the back of the garage door down the street or that I ask them to sing and try to touch every wall in the room with their sound. Something like that would be a distraction technique that I would use. Um, I might start them with humming because if enough things are in the way, I want to get down to what their actual sound is. And so I go probably a progression of hum, then ng, then words. And I might also pick one note for them to sing it on so that they don't have the distraction of intervals um, and range to bring in muscle. So I'm, I would start with that. Does that answer your question? Thank you. You betcha. Um, okay, we've got time for one more. Let's do uh, modifications at range extremes. Um, a lot of times we see ha this happening uh, where especially basses, especially in a smaller chorus when the basses really have a big job to fill the, the, fa the balance foundation requirements for the chorus, um, especially if you don't have a lot of low basses, you have to have smart basses. And so they need to take advantage of all of their resonation and all of their um, articulation and, and phonation getting the sound outside of the mouth so that the chorus sound can benefit by having as much of their full voice all the time as they can so that they support the chorus. All right, so Janice. A lot of what, times what happens when the, when the, the chorus has had that uh, type of instruction is basses, and especially how many of us from the 80s did a whole bunch of uh, raised palate singing because they said, have the egg in your mouth standing tall. Right? And so we went around for a long time with our palate overly lifted while we tried to sing. Well, when you go down way deep in a low range, no matter what part you sing, or if you try to go real high in, a, in your upper range, no matter what part you sing, that lifted palate does not serve you. So you have to, number one, you have to make sure that the palate does what it's designed to do on its own. And all we're doing is giving it signals to enhance what it does naturally. Well, what it does naturally when you sing low is that it wants to relax and be fluid because it's a membrane, it's not a piece of bone, it's, it's mostly a piece of cartilage, and you want it to kind of do its own thing and relax. Well, if you try to keep your hard palate open, do me a scale on uh, uh, with your uh, pal palate lifted. Uh, <clears throat> uh, hum it. Mm, good. Now, uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I was letting it loose. <laughs> like I said, doing it wrong is sometimes harder. Let me do it with you. Twenty years. Let me let me do it with you. So see how much it's going back and it's getting really dark and it's tense. It's, it's providing tension because she's trying to lift her palate with a muscle. So now what we'll do is as we go down, we're going to try to relax our soft palate so that the space does, instead of this all the time, it kind of comes down and it's a little bit more of a like putting a VCR in the tape player. Oops, there's my time. Yeah, and um, and you'll see that the sound starts to then come out of the mouth as you relax the soft palate down low. Here we go. Uh, 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 yeah, it's so so much better, and I was able to go a little bit lower. Um, do it on an E because the vowel choice matters. Tall E. e. E is a better choice for going down low like that. Awesome. Good. Thank you very much, Vanna. <laughs> All right. So in wrapping up, I threw a lot of stuff at you today. Any other questions? Humming, bubbling, and NG also function as semi-occluded vocal fold exercises. Yes. As if, in fact, you were singing, you know, bubbling through a straw in a glass of water. 
Those are also awesome vocal tracks. Uh, definitely. Yes, I will. I will send the um, the script out, Judy. And uh, for Region 13, I will, I will I will send the script, and they can add it to the handouts online. Uh, anything else? Awesome. Are you overwhelmed? If you are overwhelmed, let me put my um, my email address in the chat, and you can email me, and I'll be happy to clarify. And if you want to FaceTime or Zoom, I'm happy to do that. Um, but this has been great. It's been a great uh, exercise for me to pull up uh, a bunch of old skills and pull them together into a new class, so thank you for that. Uh, get out there and work with people because you have skills, and we want to hear what you have to say and what you bring to the party, and I want to hear some new ideas from you next time I get in front of you. So that's it. Thanks again for having me, and I'll see you later. Mm.